All right, thank you all for coming today. Uh, we are here to be uh, witness the interns summer projects. Uh, and if you had not gotten a chance uh, to meet Bailey or Hannah uh, during the summertime, um, you know, you have one day to come out and say hi to them. <laughs> but, uh, you know, feel free to reach out to them via email afterwards uh, and get in touch with them with any further questions. But uh, they were both great summer interns, and they're going to give you a little brief uh, introduction themselves at the beginning of their presentations. And Bailey is going to go first. Uh, go ahead, Bailey. Go. Yep, go ahead and share your screen. It's making me um, say that I can share one second. <laughs> So I guess I'll do my introduction while I'm doing this. Um, my name is Bailey Sudemeyer. I was uh, a student at Truman State University and just graduated in May with my bachelor's in agriculture science. My interests are in soil sustainable agriculture and forestry. Um, I will be going to Missouri State uh, this coming week for my, um, sorry, I'm typing in passwords for my master's in uh, sustainable agriculture, specifically looking at agroforestry. So it's gonna make me leave the meeting and then come back. <laughs> That's all right. So Bailey be back momentarily. And just Bailey will be talking about soils here at Litzinger and at some adjoining sites. Uh, she came in with a big interest in, you know, wanting to know how she can learn about local ecology and how that can uh, affect how we can interact with people uh, working in the agric agricultural fields. So uh, expect really cool things from Bailey in the future. Okay, we're back. <laughs> All right. Okay, so today I'm gonna to talk about um, soils, specifically the prairie soils here at Litzinger and then comparing those to a few others. Um, I'll start out kind of talking about sampling methods and then going into different tests you can do at home and then my results from my um, experiments. So soil testing is very important to do because soils give us an insight on the health of different um, ecosystems and specifically the prairies that we can't see with our eyes. And soils are what's gonna cycle, store, and release um, different waters, minerals, gases, and other nutrients. And it's also very important to conserve our soils because what we can destroy in minutes can take years to replenish. So what is dirt and what is soil? This is the easiest way to um, really make any soil scientist very upset. Uh, so you never want to call soil dirt because soil is not dirt. Dirt was once soil. So soil is going to be um, different things put together that can support life. And it's actually a complete ecosystem on its own uh, that we can't really see with the naked eye. And then dirt is not going to be able to support life. Um, dirt is what you get on your clothes or what you track inside. So this picture here that I put up um, is a pretty good representation of that. So for all my samples, I only took about a cup to two cups of soil from all of the prairies and put them into plastic bags. And as you can see, I actually had uh, germination in most of the bags, which is pretty cool since you know, I took it out of its environment and some of these bags are still um, getting little sprouts in them, which is, it's been probably four weeks since they were taken from the prairies. So for methods, um, these are the three most common uh, sampling tools that you're gonna see. 
soil scientists use. So we have the sampling rings or bulk density rings. And this is for samples that you don't want to compact the soil. Um, so if you're looking at something like bulk density or anything really that you don't want to disturb the sample itself, soil augers are pretty similar to that and that they're not going to do much compaction. Uh, they will get deeper than the rings and they're a little bit easier to use than the rings. And then soil cores are like the augers, but they're going to be much smaller and your sample is only going to be about an inch maybe in diameter. So that's more for tests that you're going to send off um, and combine with other samples for more of a soil chemistry. Since I'm sure most of you don't have these tools at your house, uh, shovels and trowels also work great. I actually use soup cans instead of the sampling rings. So soup cans work great too. So the first um, method I'm gonna talk to you guys about is something that you can do for free at your house. Uh, and it's just kind of getting your hands dirty, really seeing what your soil is and what you have. So it's gonna be texture by feel. So all you have to do is you get a little um, scoop of soil in your hand and you're gonna slowly add water until you can kind of squeeze it and form a nice little ball. And um, then you can look up on Google uh, soil texture flow chart. They're really easy to use. You're just gonna you know, roll it up into a ball and then you squeeze it and you, there's a bunch of different questions like, is it gonna crack? Um, if not, and that's kind of gonna lead you into what kind of soil you're dealing with. So that's kind of where this nice triangle comes into play. So this is a soil texture triangle. Um, it's going to tell you what kind of soil you have, and then you can go from there. Typically, you want a loam that's kind of the best growing soil. If you have um, a lot of clay in your soil, it's probably going to be a little bit compacted, a little heavier than what you want. Your roots are going to have a harder time penetrating through. And then with sand, uh, it's going to be really easy for things to go through, but it's not going to hold like water very well. So you're going to have your soil dry out a lot. And when I talk about the little balls, um, I don't know if you guys can still see me, but if you can see me, it's this is as big as it needs to be and you just roll it up. Um, they're kind of fun to make. I like doing it. So yeah. Yes, we can see those little balls. Okay, cool, great. They'll come into play later too. Um, so then the next thing you can do is you can look at your soil color. So color is actually gonna tell us a lot about our soil. Uh, soil scientists are going to use the Munzel color book, and that is a great way of classifying soils and kind of assigning them a number so that you can compare them across the world or even just year to year um, to see if you have any changes. So things that are going to affect that color is going to be your organic matter, if there's any leaching in the soil, so if there's any nutrients kind of being carried away by water, um, and then things such as iron that's oxidized. So in these pictures, these are from Scott George. He helped me out a lot. Um, I'm sure some of you know of him. He's a soil scientist that's come out to Litzinger before. And he took awesome pictures with his book at Calvary Cemetery. Um, so this top picture is one that you can see the there's a darker sample on top and then there's a lighter sample below it. So that is probably, I would say, the different horizons. So that first, the darker one is going to be more of your topsoil or your A horizon. And then the one below it is likely a B horizon, which is your subsoil. And the book is pretty cool because it looks at the chroma value and hue. And that's also um, very similar to what like painters use, and they have uh, very similar books. But lucky for us, there is an app that you can do the same thing. It's called the Munsell's Color Chart app, and it's free. Books are very expensive, so I'm very thankful for that because I just have the app. So the next thing you can look at is your structure. So your structure, you're looking at the ped sizes. So that's just the particles that are grouped together. Um, ideally, you want a lot of aggregates, which is going to be the granular up in the on the picture on the right in the top left corner. So that's what you want. That's your ideal situation. Um, an example of that is the middle picture on the bottom left. Um, let me see if I can get a pointer. Mm -hmm. 
we can see the cursor's arrow too, if, if that's oh, fine. Awesome, yeah, that works. So this picture right here, that's um, gonna be your granular structure. That's ideal, that's what you want. Um, over here is gonna be more of the blocky. So it's not terrible, it's gonna be a lot harder. Um, if you were to feel it, it's gonna be really hard so you can't break it up into this granular structure. And then this last one is gonna be close to a single grain. I wouldn't really consider it a single grain, but it was the closest that we found. Uh, and this is, single grains typically gonna be like super sandy. So it's just not gonna hold water. And then the massive over here is typically gonna be like a clay. So the water is just gonna sit on top. Uh, if you dig really far down in your soil and then you get to a point that like you can no longer dig, it's possibly a clay pan, which is gonna be a massive structure. And your water is just not gonna penetrate, roots aren't gonna penetrate. And then the last one I'll talk about is the platy. So that's going to be commonly seen around like creek beds or in areas that flood. And that's just going to be different deposits that have over time just kind of settled there and they're just going to stack on top of each other. Okay, so if you were to want to compare different areas of your yard or different um, beds that you've planted, maybe one's doing really well and the other one's not. I mean, you're not really sure why. The soil is definitely something important to look at. So the first thing I would recommend is looking at the location. Maybe your soil or your bed is at the top of a hill. Maybe it's at an angle at the bottom, or it could be near um, any sort of water, any sort of puddling. So first you wanna look at the location, and then you're gonna look at what kind of plants are sitting on that soil. Um, is there a lot of grasses? Is there, is there a lot of forbs? Then you can look at the depth to compaction. So that's gonna be how hard is it to um, put the trowel or whatever you're using in to the soil? Is it really, are you having a lot of force um, to get that in there? And then you can line up your um, samples like how I did in these columns. And I looked at the color structure and texture. So even though you don't know the history of these prairies right now, you can get a pretty good idea just based on those three things about what I might find. So that's the first thing I did. As you can see, this one right here, Calvary, it's much darker, especially compared to Bluebird. And we'll talk about why that might be in a little bit. Um, and then you can also see the different uh, structures. You can't see the textures, but I'm sure you can imagine. I'm sure you've all felt soil that it might have looked like this before. So we'll talk about these in a little bit as well. Okay, so now getting into what I was actually doing. Um, so I looked at remnant and restored prairies and their soils to see the progress of restoration on the soils. So remnant prairies have remained undisturbed for thousands of years. Um, they've not been tilled, they've not been destroyed. And then restored prairies have been um, disturbed typically by either tilling or plowing or just various developments. So picking my prairies and the plots, all of my prairies, I wanted them to be in similar conditions as far as where they were located. So they were all near waterways that commonly flood. And then uh, I also looked at online soil maps, which you have access to. They're a great way to um, look to see what kind of soil your land is sitting on, but it's not as specific as going out and feeling it yourself. Um, so I did this to see and figure out what areas were most like Litzinger. So Litzinger sits on silt loam, which is common in floodplains and um, is actually a pretty good soil. And then they're also on a very low slope. And then the restored prairies all had some sort of agricultural purpose in their past. And then within the prairies, I did three plots, and then each plot had a three meter radius with 10 different samples from those plots. Um, and then this picture over here, so this is kind of what my plots looked like. So they had the three meter radius, and then all of these stars are where I took the um, samples just to keep it consistent throughout all of my plots. And then I had two plots in each prairie that were on a drier, um, area and then one that was 
in an area with a higher moisture content. And I'll talk about how I determined this. So as you can see from these maps from um, Google Earth, I looked back to an area that, or a time that they took pictures of the prairies that you could really see like differences in color contrast. So the darker areas indicate that there's a higher moisture content. And as you can see, um, A and C in all of these prairies are in a lighter spot and then the B is the darker one. So that's how I determined um, just keeping consistency as well as looking for changes in the areas with higher moisture and drier. So the first prairie that I went to was Bluebird Meadow. Bluebird Meadow is the youngest prairie I went to. Um, it was, it went under restoration in 2017 with its last fire in spring of this year. It was pretty compacted. Um, primarily grass and a very thin oak horizon. So the history on Bluebird Meadow, it was a sod farm. Um, so sod is, you're just growing grass. So what they do is they actually strip the top layer of soil and organic matter along with the grass um, off the soil many times, um, which leaves the soil bare and that you know leads to compaction and other things. So as you can see from these Samples right here, this was the lightest, um, signifying that there's probably not a lot of organic matter in it, which is very, very important. And then the ground cover at Bluebird Meadow, there was a lot of bare um, ground, which is as expected from its um, past, but you could definitely tell that it probably wouldn't have the healthiest soil when I got the results back. So here's a picture, again, there was a late fire. So as you can see this kind of, there's a lot of green over here and there's a lot of yellow over there. So all of the yellow is where the fire actually took place and the green was a fire break. So since I did have a late burn that likely killed off a lot of the forbs for this year. Um, so the green might be a better representation of what it would have looked like had they had not done such a late fire. Even still though, it was very, very short compared to the prairies that you all have seen here at Litzinger. So then this top picture is Bluebird Meadow in 2008 when it um, was a sod farm and the bottom is now. So as you can see, it's very um, dark and similar up in the, blue, in the 2008 picture. This is because it was a monoculture. So a lot of agriculture is monoculture. So that's, you're only growing one thing on the land, which is not great for the soil because different plants have different nutrient uptakes and they also release different um, nutrients back into the soil. So when this happens and it's a monoculture, the soil is really, really rich in one thing and then is, doesn't have much of the other thing. So then that impacts the different organisms in the soil because they can't survive off of just what the um, grass didn't use. So then uh, I went to all the Litzinger prairies as well. So North Prairie was pretty healthy looking, high four ratio, um, 36 feet tall. And Bluebird was around two feet tall. I don't think I said that before. And there was a high diversity, high root presence, little visible soil. They did just burn it this past year. Um, it was started in 18, 1989 and um, it was cropland. So as you can see from this soil, um, these soil samples, it was almost kind of sandy. It had very, very small aggregates. And we'll kind of see the other ones. So as you can see, compared to South, they are very small. So South Prairie was a little bit taller, but also had a little bit of a wider range in the heights. Um, if you've been to it lately, there is a few spots that it's actually kind of short. So it did have a high diversity as well, a thick thatch ground cover. It was very easy to probe. It was very wet, which was interesting. I did take North and South um, just a day apart and there wasn't any water that should have remained or been added to it from rain or anything. And it was also started at the same time. So they're the same age and it was also used as cropland. So pasture prairie, pasture prairie is very tall. Um, 
And then I saw the same things, low compaction, little visible soil, thick growth, high diversity. It was started a little bit later, so in 1995, but it had previously been used for um, a pasture most recently. And as you can see from its samples, they're very dark, they're very well aggregated. Um, overall, very, very good soil there. So Calvary Cemetery is the remnant I looked at. So Calvary was um, very tall and it had varying levels of compaction. It was a little bit different than the others um, in that every spot I went to was pretty different. And it had very thick growth, high diversity. It was last burned in January of 2020. And then here's the soil samples. Um, they have a little bit of an oxidized look. So they're a little bit of an orange or red, um, but very well aggregated. There was a little bit of a higher clay content that I could feel. So while Calvary is a remnant, um, it could probably be considered a restored remnant because while it was identified in the 90s, it sat for a while without anyone like restoring it or really maintaining it. So for about 10 years, it was considered a woodland because there was a lot of trees and a lot of shrubs, as you can see over here. Um, and then plans began in 2012 to restore it back to its natural prairie condition. So as you can see from this picture, this is what it looks like now. Um, these trees back here are just a tree line, so it's not part of the prairie. So it looks really good. It's very, very thick. Um, we walked through it. There wasn't trails when we went. A week later, we went back and there was trails. But we had a good time walking through it. So then now that we know a little bit about the history, we'll look back at this and um, it makes sense now that Bluebird would be the lightest, Calvary is the darkest, Pasture Prairie um, is also pretty dark. So Bluebird again is the one that is the youngest. It was a sod farm, very little organic matter left on it in the past. And Calvary is that remnant prairie that has been around for thousands of years without being really touched. Um, and then pasture, well, it was ag land, it was never, well, it was tilled at one point since it's not a remnant, but in the most recent years, it was just a pasture, so it had a lot of organic matter. Um, I believe, if I'm right, I think James said that it was a horse pasture. So then for the tests that I did, I sent some of them to a lab or two different labs at the University of Missouri, Mizzou. So the first result I got back was organic matter. Um, organic matter is arguably the most important thing in soil. It is one is gonna store and supply your nutrients, uh, retain toxic elements, and it's where everything is gonna come from organic matter and then go deeper into the soil. And that's how you really get that good, healthy soil. So my results over here um, were as expected. The bluebird had the lowest percent of organic matter, but still not that low. So it was still pretty good, um, especially for the color. It was very pale, which I thought that it wasn't going to have much organic matter at all. And then Calvary did have the most organic matter. Um, and if you remember, North Prairie was also burned recently, so that could be why it had a higher percentage as well. So for organic matter, you want to sit in that two to 5% range, because um, these over here, they are percents. So Calvary is definitely the best, and Bluebird was the lowest. So pH, um, pH measures acidity and alkalinity of the soil. So that's what's going to affect how your plants are going to be able to take up nutrients. And it also impacts a lot of things such as activity, activity of the microorganisms. And what's gonna um, kind of determine that is your rainfall and temperature. There is things you can do to alter that, such as um, in agriculture, liming is super popular to bring that pH up and make it less acidic. So six to 7.5 is typically gonna be your general goal, but it really depends on the climate. So here in St. Louis, um, it's normal for the soils to be a little bit acidic because we are in a hot and humid area, especially right now. 
Um, so how the pH works though. So what it's gonna do is it's gonna kind of help the plant get those nutrients. It's kind of like a key in a lock situation. So plants need a certain pH to be able to unlock those nutrients that it needs and take those in which is why sometimes when you plant things, they might not take the way you wanted them to. Um, James gave me the uh, examples of azaleas and pin oaks that they like more acidic soil. And if you don't have that acidic soil, they're not gonna do great. So, and if you ever have a plant that's really struggling and you've tried everything, maybe looking into what kind of pH it likes as well as figuring out what kind of pH you have. And another way to do this at home, it's not as um, guaranteed to give you a great answer, but you can actually take the pH testing strips that you can find at like pet stores for aquariums. And you can do the same thing. There's a lot of tutorials online. You just let your soil soak for a little bit and then you actually just test the water and it'll tell you about what the pH is. So as you can see over here, all of the soils had pretty similar pHs. They're all a little bit acidic, not terrible, common for the area. So cation exchange capacity is what I looked at next. So that's gonna be the um, soil's ability to hold and exchange cations. So what that is, is you have the soil particles and then you have the roots. And so in order for them to exchange, there's different positive and negative charges that take place. So this is just measuring how many um, cations are able to ex be exchanged. So this is gonna be influenced by water and pH. Um, you can uh, add organic matter to raise it. So the next um, calcium, phosphorus, potassium, and magnesium. So what these are gonna do, um, this is another part of the test, the original test I did. Calcium is what is really gonna help your roots and potassium is gonna be for the stem and the stalk. And then phosphorus is gonna be for your flower and fruit formation. And magnesium is gonna be that uh, for the chlorophyll, that green color that really helps in light absorption with photosynthesis. So as you can see from all of these results, um, again, Bluebird is typically the lowest um, for potassium and phosphorus. And potassium and phosphorus do take a very long time. It takes about eight years to replenish this. So it makes sense that Bluebird would be low here. Um, over here with the phosphorus, North Prairie has a lot of phosphorus in it. Uh, that is likely due to the fact that it was just burned. So then after I got all my results, um, and I recommend this, if you guys do this, if you compare anything really um, with a lab, it can be really hard to read all of the data. So putting it into graphs like this and putting it all together, you can really see trends. So as you can see, most of them are gonna kind of go up um, with Bluebird being the lowest and Calvary being the highest. Um, and then occasionally the prayers here at Litzinger are high, but most of the time they're in that middle range between the two. And then as well as looking at the heights of the prairies and recording that, you can see a nice increase there as well. So this is not included in the original um, testing that I did, but bulk density is going to measure the density of the soil. So that's gonna really tell us how um, nutrients and water and roots are gonna be able to move through the soil. So you want um, a lower bulk density, and then that kind of goes hand in hand with porosity, so you want high porosity. Um, porosity is just different spaces within the soil that water could go into, um, roots, air, nutrients. And what's gonna really impact this bulk density is compaction, because that's gonna make it much heavier. Um, so compaction can be caused by many, many things. The most obvious one is if you drive a tractor or a four-wheeler through an area of land, it's going to kind of smush the um, soil down quite a bit. But other things can just be walking through a prairie, um, walking on soil. So that's why a lot of times you're going to see paths that are made very clear. That's why you should always stick to paths because even though you're just walking over it once, um, that is compacting the soil. 
because just something like rain hitting bare soil can impact it as well. And um, that'll actually cause it to crust over. And then it's really hard for like rain to actually get into the soil. It just kind of runs off of the soil. And then um, it's also very important to note that when your soil is wet, is especially when you stay, want to stay off of it, because it's very soft, it's going to compact much, much easier. So over here, um, these are all very similar values, so it's hard to realize it without the numbers there. But the bulk density and the porosity do go hand in hand. Um, so Calvary is going to be the best in this case. And then South Prairie is actually was the most um, compacted, had the least pore space, which was interesting to me. Um, but then again, Bluebird, not the best. Uh, it's very young. So and with all of the ag work that was done to it very recently, it's normal for that to happen, especially since it was bare, so bare soil. Hey, Bailey. Yeah. Are you surprised that Bluebird wasn't worse than what the results showed? Yeah, I was actually very surprised um, because going back in time, it was right at 2017 that that sod farm, I guess, was sold. Um, so they were doing it up until then. So I don't know. My guess is it's just had plants on it long enough that the roots have really penetrated because um, they do they do have a good spread of plants. There was a lot of grass, but that was due to the fire happening. So yeah, I was very surprised, but I mean, once you get worms in there, those are gonna be the best things for your soil because they are aggregators. They you know really till up that soil in a good way and they make a lot of different air spaces. And um, so that's really gonna help. So that would be my guess. And the area that it was in, it was pretty close um, to a creek. So I think, and woodlands, so I think that that probably helped it a lot. And you got a question in the uh, chat about where is Bluebird? And also just to follow up on what you were just saying, uh, you said earlier that you were taking samples uh, down how far? Because you, I remember you saying that you like hit about five inches down was mm -hmm. where it seemed like it was really compacted. Did much of that soil below that five inch mark actually get into the bulk density? No, so with that, um, that is likely a different horizon. So I don't wanna mix horizons too much because different horizons are gonna have different results in this. So some people will take and do and compare the different horizons within the soil. I believe that's what Scott George did here. Um, if you guys remember that presentation, he had the different, he had like zero to six inches, so all of mine were in the zero to six inch range. Um, and then what was the first question? Uh, we had in the chat, uh, where is Bluebird Meadow? Yeah, so Bluebird Meadow is in Dardine Prairie. Um, I don't remember exactly. That's uh, St. Charles County. Yeah. And it has a very nice walking trail. If you're interested in that, it's paved, um, a very nice walk. And th that's a part of uh, Great River Greenways, correct? Yes. Yep. So since I was an ag major um, and I'm into sustainable agriculture, I just wanted to put this little blip in there. So this is a tiller, um, very common in agriculture. Trying to get away from using them though, because what they do is they make your soil less, um, they like lower the bulk density but just for a very short amount of time. So what these discs are gonna do is they're gonna go in there and break up clods and kind of loosen the soil up so that when they plant, then the roots are able to penetrate and you know, you're able to grow very nice um, crops. But over time, what that does is all it is doing is um, kind of destroying the natural pores. So then as soon as it rains, that's all gonna compact down really, really hard. And that's why sometimes you go to ag fields before they've been tilled and it's this very, very hard crust and it'll even crack sometimes. Um, and that's another thing, cover crops to reduce the amount of rain that's hitting the soil directly. So cover crops and no-till is kind of the way ag is trying to go at the moment. Um, just thought I'd put that out there as well. 
So aggregate stability is the next test I did. So it's gonna measure the erodibility and infiltration of the soil by water. So how easily soil or water can go in and then how easily the soil is gonna erode due to water. So aggregates are produced by the microbial community. Um, earthworms are very, very good and very, very common in the aggregation process. So the history of the site can greatly influence aggregate stability. As you can see over here from my results, um, all of the prairies at Litzinger actually have very, very great aggregate stability. And this is likely due to the fact that they do flood the most often with Deer Creek, Creek right here, um, flooding fairly often. They have a historical um, past of you know, runoff happening. So these soil particles have actually kind of, I guess, adapted to that, which is pretty neat to see. Um, and then again, Bluebird is the lowest. Calvary is not great, um, but Calvary doesn't flood near as much. Right, and then I also did PLFA testing. Unfortunately, these results I have not received back yet from the lab. There was some complications there, but it's still very important to talk about. Um, so I will explain all these different tests. So this is determining the microbial community's activity. So the gram negative and gram positive bacteria are gonna be in your soil. Um, it's gonna improve, improve plant growth, that's going to be what's breaking down the new organic matter. Um, and then it kind of goes from negative to positive. So negative is going to be at the top of the, of the soil, and then positive is going to be below that. So it's going to get all of the organic matter that the gram negative has kind of already started to break down. And the gram negative is sensitive to water. So it's a good um, factor to kind of look at when you're looking at different stressors, such as drought. And we'll talk about that in a minute as well. So methanotrophs are gonna be what is combining oxygen and methane into organic compounds. So this is looked at a lot with the greenhouse gases and climate change studies. Um, as you can see over here, uh, this right here is kind of the role that the methanotrophs play. Um, so very important to um, kind of combating the different greenhouse gases. Eukaryotes, it's gonna be all of your little creepy crawlies in the soil that are kind of fun to look at, um, maybe not to everybody, but they're gonna be very, very important because um, it's kind of a really cool effect when you go from up here, the organic matter, and then your fungi and bacteria, and then it's just kind of gonna go down this line and all of this is really gonna help your soil out as well. So this is just looking at how many um, are there in the soil and you know, how rich is your soil with these different decomposers. So gram positive and gram negative ratios, again, is gonna indicate uh, stressful conditions. So contamination, um, droughts, stuff like that. Fungal bacterial ratio, so this, um, a decrease is likely due to disturbance or environmental chemical changes. Um, I decided to add this picture. I'm sure a lot of you have seen it um, when you're digging through your soil, but maybe you don't know what it is. This is uh, mycelium. So that's what, uh, it's a, it's fungal, um, I think it's fungal cells. And that's kind of what mushrooms are gonna come from. And it's really good for the soil um, health. So then stress ratio, stress ratio again, is looking at uh, gram negative to indicate stress. So my results um, from the at-home tests, I could tell that Calvary and Pasture Prairie were probably gonna be my healthiest soils. Um, again, because they were super dark, well aggregated, and then Bluebird was probably gonna be on the lower end of the scale just because it's lighter um, and it was pretty hard, very you know, compacted when I had originally looked at it. 
And then from the regular fertility analysis, Calvary uh, definitely had the healthiest soil and bluebirds was the least healthy, but still not bad. Um, really for all of these prairies, I was pretty surprised by the fact that none of them were super low. They were all pretty healthy. Um, even though they looked a lot different, they were all still healthy on the scale um, from you know just different soils around the world. And then on the bulk density aggregate stability PLFA, still don't have results for the PLFA to really make uh, a clear distinction on what soil was healthiest there. But I do plan on making a report if anyone's interested in that. Um, once I get those results back, I think that'll be super interesting because microbial communities are something we don't look at often, but they're very important. So then kind of who won being closest to the remnant prairie was the pasture prairie. Um, so this was not surprising because it's so tall and the soil looks so great, but it can kind of give us an insight on the impact that um, maybe agricultural practices have had on soil. The fact that it is quite a bit younger than um, North and South Prairie, yet it was still so um, healthy, was probably due to the fact that it was a pasture. So it wasn't being tilled, it wasn't being destroyed. There was just animals on it um, adding organic matter every day. Uh, so kind of going off of this, for my master's program, I really wanna look at the different sustainable agriculture practices such as no-till and um, prairie strips and stuff like that and kind of seeing if that has a better impact on the soils in the long run instead of really hurting the soil like typical cropping practices have. So if you're interested in sending your own soil samples off, um, here's some information on that. So the First one that I did that I had the most information for, um, you can take your samples right to the extension offices or you can send them to the lab. Other than that, um, you can also send them to this other soil health assessment if you're interested in the microbial stuff. And then thank you to everybody who helped me out. Um, I couldn't have done it without these people. Uh, Scott George was a soil scientist. Uh, Dr. Bob Johnson was one of my professors. Aaron Shank and Tom Schweiss were the ones that allowed me to go to Bluebird and Calvary and take samples there, as well as the LREC team. Um, definitely couldn't have done it without them. They helped me out a lot, and I have really appreciated them throughout my internship. Um, I have gained a lot of knowledge, and I'm very excited to take this with me to my master's program. And any questions? Fantastic job, Bailey. Um, and I know soils is a hard subject to get people excited about, but you did a fantastic job communicating it all. Thank you. Yeah, I, I sat through soil classes. I know the lectures can be rough. I really wish you guys could have came and we could have, you know, really looked at the soils in person, hands on, but unfortunately that can't happen right now. Maybe someday I'll come back. <laughs> all right. Uh, we got a couple questions coming in. Uh, can you explain the difference, or yeah, can you explain the difference between mycelium and mycorrhizae? Um, I am not exactly sure. I didn't look into that part that much. Um, I um, have studied the mycorrhizae, and the mycelium picture that you had there looks so much like mycorrhizae. But I remember talking to uh, James when we were on the prairie once about mycorrhizae and you cannot see that by the naked eye, if I recall correctly, that looks like this, but it is microscopic. Is that correct, James? So again, I, I'm not even an expert in that. It's like that's beyond my field, but from what I do know, just you know, interacting with folks that study that stuff, the, the mycorrhizae are the types of fungi that are interacting with plants. Uh, if I recall correctly, I think mycelium are actually just parts of those fungi. So like those visible things that you can see. Uh, so I, I believe like you could potentially, you know, mycelium, like mycorrhizae would have mycelium if, if I'm remembering that correctly. Okay. Um, so mycorrhizae are usually just fungi that have these special connections with plants directly. Um, 
and then the mycelium, yeah, I, I believe is just actually a directly a product, but I am no expert in that field. I, um, I've got my little Teamy with Microbes book here, and there is a chapter on mycorrhizae. Um, and he, he actually wrote a book to uh, Teamy with Fungi, which is covering Yeah, that's probably the one that. to read, yeah. Um, yeah, I took a mushrooms class at one point, but I'm not, they talked briefly about it, but not enough to be able to explain it too much. Something about their nutrient magnets and they help bring nutrients into the plant. And there's a kind of a symbiotic relationship where the plants actually give um, nutrients to the mycorrhizae as well. So there's an exchange there from what I remember. But they look so much alike, but um, yeah, thank you very much. Sorry, I was hitting the space bar and it didn't work that time. Uh, the other question you have is what is a PLFA? Yeah, so that's the phospholipid, phospholipid fatty acid. Um, so that's just how they determine the microbial um, communities. So it's what they produce. So it's just kind of the easiest way to assess what the activity is in your soil with the microbials. All right, I think that is it that we have for questions for Bailey. Anybody else have a question for Bailey before we move on to Hannah? All right. And I was just looking it up while we were sitting here. Uh, the mycelium is the vegetative part of any fungus. So yes, so the structure we were looking at was the mycelium there in that image. So essentially kind of like what your like root-like structure of fungi is the mycelium, so. And then the, the mushroom that we see is the fruit. Yeah, that is the, like the, the fruiting body, the, the reproductive structures, yeah. So a lot of people always think of that when they think of fungi, but they should really be thinking about those mycelium as the fungi itself. All right. Well, thank you so much, Bailey. Thank you. All right, Hannah, are you there? Is, is your I'm speaking partner there with you as well? <laughs> All right. Um, I don't think I can do this whole thing with this, this little bunny on my hand, but yeah, <laughs> I did practice at home. Um, All right. Uh, so our second presenter today is Hannah, uh, and she uh, has again been uh, fantastic to work with here over the summer. Uh, Hannah, you want to do a little introduction, and then uh, go ahead and start sharing your screen after that. Amazing. So, hi, I'm Hannah Burke. Um, I am a senior at SLU. I'm studying environmental science with a concentration in biology, and hopefully we'll go on to a master's or PhD program after that. So, I'm going to share my screen, um, and I'm going to mute myself because I don't want you to hear my grunts and frustration if it does not go well. Can you guys see the screen? Yes, we can. Amazing. All righty then. So hi again, I'm Hannah. And uh, today I'm gonna to be talking to you about three-toed box turtle monitoring. 
How can I? Oh, it's interesting. It is not letting me go forward in the presentation. Oh, no, never mind. It's starting to work. It's okay. <laughs> okay, so before I get started, um, I think it's important to have a basis of turtle anatomy. So I'm not throwing terms out, out at you that you won't understand. So turtles essentially have the same organs as humans, just scrunched down and protected by a nice little layer of shell. So they have trachea, lung, stomach, heart, liver, all in there. Um, and it's protected by a shell. So the shell is composed of two parts. The uh, upper shell is called the uh, carapace. Um, and that is composed of shoots. So right here is the shoot. So these are these little puzzle pieces on top of the shell. So the larger uh, upper uh, shoots are called the coastal shoots. And the um, shoots around the sides are called the um, marginal shoots because they're around the margin of the shell. The lower part of the shell is called the um, plasterone. And uh, the turtles also have faces just like you and I, but instead of the nose uh, area, it is called a beak. And they also have a tail. Um, so before I get into actual three-toed box turtles, I think it's uh, important that we figure out how to identify the turtles around us. So I'm gonna go through all of the turtles in Missouri um, and kind of give you um, tidbits of information and how I like to remember these turtles because it can be hard sometimes. Um, so I have them broken up into aquatic, semi-aquatic and land turtles. So starting off uh, with our aquatic turtles, we have the snappy turtles, which in my opinion kind of look like dinosaurs, um, but that's just me. So the common snapping turtle is this guy right here. And below him is the um, alligator snapping turtle. The alligator snapping turtle actually is the largest turtle in um, Missouri. And these turtles tend to have rougher skin, thicker tails. They're generally bigger, um, but how you can tell the alligator uh, snapping turtle from the common snapping turtle is that the alligator snapping turtle will have these three lines of serration on the top of their uh, carapace. Uh, whereas the common snapping turtle does not have that area. Uh, also, the alligator snapping turtle has a more pointed beak. So the yellow mud turtle, it kind of looks like if a turtle was made out of sand to me. Um, so it has this distinct yellowish tannish color, looks like sand, um, and it's all over their um, classroom, their uh, carapace, and their head and eyes are even that color. So that's this guy right here. So completely yellow. It's a good name for him. Um, and then, so we move on to the stink pot turtle, which has these two distinct lines on either side of its face and neck. Uh, those are yellow lines. And it's called the stink pot because whenever it is uh, undergoing fear of predation, it will emit a very bad odor. Um, they might like you, but you do not want to hold these guys. Or if you do have like some sort of like mask or something, not like it. Um, and Hannah, uh, I, I wanted to point out to you, you can use your cursor, we can see it if you ever wanted to show like those little detailed lines around their eyes, things like that. Oh, splendid. Thank you. So um, going on to the river cooter. So this guy right here is the river cooter, and they are known for having small blunt heads. And I don't know why I remember it like this, but uh, the river cooter has two small O's that are small and blunt, just like their heads. Um, so more aquatic turtles. Um, a lot of the turtles that you will find in Missouri are aquatic. Um, so there are the painted turtles, which are beautiful turtles. They look like they could be painted. So first and foremost, you have the Western painted turtle, which has this uh, vibrant, orangish, uh, reddish plasterone right here. And the southern painted turtle, which has um, a thin reddish orangish line down its uh, carapace. Uh, I remember this because the southern painted turtle, uh, it has a line that goes down south. So 
And so then you have the red eared slider, uh, aptly named because it has a red line down its um, headish neck area uh, behind its eye. And then you have the Western chicken turtle, which is this guy right here. Um, the Western chicken turtle has a very long um, neck that kind of looks like a chicken's neck. And it has these yellow lines on its head and neck. So then we have our soft shells. Um, they have elongated snouts and they don't have shells how we would imagine shells to be. They have uh, thicker skin that acts as a shell. So you have the Midland Smooth and the Eastern Spiny soft shells. Um, the differentiation between these two is that the Midland Smooth soft shell uh, does not have bumps while the Eastern Spiny soft shell does. So this is the Eastern Spiny soft shell and this is the Midland Smooth soft shell. So moving on to semi-aquatic turtles. So uh, starting off with the Blandings turtle. The Blandings turtle has a uh, distinctive yellow um, chin and neck. Uh, they also have yellow speckles um, along its shell. Uh, you can say this turtle isn't bland. Um, so then we have the mask turtles. Um, the mask turtles are over here. They have this duration on the top of their shell. Uh, you can tell the difference between them um, by the yellow mark behind their eyes. So the common mask turtle has a yellow dot behind its eye. Um, the Wichita mask turtle has um, an L-shaped yellow mark behind its eyes that connects down um, on its neck. Um, and the false map turtle has yellow lines, but they do not connect. So then finally we have um, the land turtles. You'll only see um, two types of land turtles in Missouri um, and they're both box turtles. So there are the ornate and three-toed box turtles. Um, this guy here is the ornate box turtle. You can tell because the top of his uh, carapace is flattened and it has those lines that kind of make it look like an ornament. So ornament, ornate. Um, and then you have the three-toed box turtle, which has a tan carapace and it has three toes on its hind legs. So uh, I'm specifically looking at box turtles. So I'm gonna go more into detail about box turtles. So the genus for a box turtle is um, paraffin. These are different from other turtles because they have a very elevated um, and keeled uh, carapace. What this means is their shell looks more circular than other shells and it has like a lip, like a glass. So you can see here how it kind of curves out like you would imagine a glass to be. So other turtles don't really have that. They also have a smaller uh, interfemoral seam and they have identical hind toes. So this type of turtle prefers woodland field edges that could marshes, bogs, and stream banks. Um, they can walk in a few inches of water, but they prefer not to um, swim in water, um, but they will be around water as a water source because they do need it to survive. So they don't like swimming in it. So uh, these turtles are also omnivores that don't eat grubs, worms, um, grasses, fruits, um, flowers, and assortments. So they have a wide variety of food that they will eat. However, when they are younger, they prefer to be more uh, carnivorous, eating more grubs, worms, and various other insects. Um, so interestingly enough, which I found very fascinating is that fox turtles can naturally live uh, over a hundred years without uh, human influence or predation, uh, which is just insane to me. Uh, however, with all of the human influence and predation that is occurring currently, uh, the average lifespan of a fox turtle is about 25 years. So naturally, because they have longer lifespans, uh, it takes them longer to reach sexual maturity. So they uh, start mating around 10 years old. Um, and they can actually store sperm for up to four years. So the females will wait until they feel like they have a uh, nice environmental condition. Uh, they're not afraid of predation before they uh, lay their eggs. So 
this means that they don't really lay their eggs annually. Um, and when they do lay the, those eggs, uh, it's really interesting that they have this um, temperature influence on them. So temperature actually influences the sexual uh, determination of the turtle. So what this means is if the turtle is about, uh, is, has been laid at about 82 degrees Fahrenheit or uh, above that temperature range, it is a female, but if it is um, laid in a environment that's under uh, 82 degrees Fahrenheit, then it is a uh, male. So it's really fascinating how temperature will influence those turtles. So uh, I'm specifically looking at the three-toed box turtle um, at the finger. Um, this is differentiated from other box turtles because again, they have three toes on their hind legs and uh, they have a largely domed uh, carapace that is has a top ridge. I don't know if you can see that here. Um, and it, their carapace happens to be tan. Uh, adults have a home range of about two to five acres. Uh, what this means is that the adults will travel about two to five acres um, in their lifetime. Um, and two to five acres is about like 2.6 to 6.5 football fields, if that gives you any reference. So the reason I want to study these turtles is because I believe they have an ecological importance. So um, I have listed a few reasons that they are ecologically important. So first and foremost, they contribute to the energy flow within an ecological system. They both serve as both predators and prey. So they are predated by snakes, uh, birds, raccoons, chipmunks, um, and they in turn will uh, predate different plants and uh, insects. Uh, they also are very beneficial for uh, nutrient cycling, um, namely calcium and phosphorus. Um, I think calcium um, nutrient cycles are kind of interesting. So whenever um, a female is about to uh, lay their eggs, then they will uh, increase their uptake of calcium, um, acting as sort of a sink for calcium. And whenever they lay these eggs, then they are a source for calcium. So they redistribute the calcium back into the environment in the form of eggs because uh, their eggs are composed largely of calcium. They also aid in the dispersal. So um, an example of this from a study I was reading is mayapple seeds. Uh, mayapple seeds actually have a higher success rate and um, higher dispersal rates uh, whenever they are distributed by um, the fecal matter of box turtles. Uh, the study was specifically looking at box turtles, so um, that is the importance of uh, box turtles in that environment. And lastly, they are important for pest management. I don't know if you guys have been out here in the summer where you'll be working in hot, sticky conditions and it seems like you're swarmed by a million mosquitoes. Um, well, box turtles can help you with that. I, I'm not suggesting um, that carrying around box turtle, by the way. I would not do that. So unfortunately, these box turtles are at risk. Um, again, uh, they have a later sexual maturation. Um, and with later sexual ma uh, maturation, it means that they take longer to reproduce. Uh, and when they do reproduce, they do not reproduce annually um, because it does, again, uh, depend on environmental factors. Um, and not to mention, whenever they reproduce, I think the average uh, amount of eggs that they will lay is about like five eggs, though I've read uh, it could be anywhere between three and nine eggs, which is not a lot, if, especially if an individual is not laying eggs annually. So with fewer individuals being added to a population, then the net loss of that population could outweigh the uh, net gain of that population. For example, if um, box turtles, if there was about 20 box turtles born in um, Lusinger a year, though uh, 25 box turtles died, you would have a net loss of about 
five FOSS turtles, and if that trend continues, the population would continue to decrease. Um, and this net loss is actually being uh, worsened by human impact. So uh, humans have a very negative impact on box turtles. Uh, very shocking, I know. Um, so a large uh, cause of mortalities in box turtles currently is habitat distract destruction. Um, World well, mortalities and these box turtles are being taken as pets and not being able to be cared for properly. So um, this is just going to kind of get worse with the urbanization. Um, in fact, uh, humans have a very detrimental impact that has been seen in research. So uh, there was a study of an area that had no human impact uh, and it was compared to an area that had been influenced by humans. So in the um, area with little human influence, the box turtles actually had a survival survival uh, rate of about uh, ninety eight percent, whereas the um, area with human influence actually had a survival rate of about eighty percent. So drastically lower than the non influence area. So you can see an uh, example of this cause of mortality right here by roadways, um, which is very, very uh, prevalent currently. So this is a study done in North Carolina by a turtle rescue group. Uh, and this turtle rescue group um, looked at data for 10 years and um, took all of the individuals who had died and kind of broke it up on how they died, what species they were. So looking specifically at the turtles, there is about um, 1,850 uh, turtles that had passed away in those 10 years that they saw. Um, and out of those um, 1,850, um, about 51.3% of those were box turtles. Um, and a large uh, component of those box turtles' deaths were from vehicular trauma. So about 480-ish. Um, of those deaths were from vehicular trauma. So 480 uh, out of that uh, 1,850 um, turtle group had died from trauma and were box turtles. Um, this is thought uh, to be because box turtles themselves have a smaller uh, interfemoral um, hinge, which I discussed earlier. And because of that, it makes their um, shell more likely to uh, crush their head uh, whenever they are rolled over by a car, which is very, very unfortunate. Um, and oh, that skipped over. There we go. So this is kind of getting into the idea of uh, habitat fragmentation. So these roadways uh, not only crush these turtles, they um, lead to habitat fragmentation, which also leads to more mortality of turtles. So whenever roadways um, segregate areas, this is called habitat fragmentation, which is basically the breaking of continuous habitats into smaller sections. Um, and again, this increases mortality among species um, by limiting the interaction between species and, and, and increasing the human interaction with species. So what do I mean with that? So this area here um, shown by this image is um, these individuals are unable to interact with the individuals from this area over here because you can see there's all of the habitat that's been destroyed. So they're less likely to walk from this area to this area, um, decreasing the amounts of mates that are available to them. Not only that, um, by adding paths and roads, uh, they have a larger chance of interacting with humans. Uh, a lot of those interactions can be negative, like hunting or, again, being run over by cars, negative. And you can see um, the effect of this habitat fragmentation on um, the mortality of species in this uh, graph here. You can see more endangered and critically endangered species um, happen to be in areas that are more highly fragmented, whereas species of lower concern are in less fragmented uh, areas. So this can 
kind of leads me into why I'm actually doing research uh, regarding turtles at LRF. So how the top presentation is occurring at um, LRF. Uh, as we know, MSD took about five acres um, of LRF property uh, out of the 39 acres to build the sewer system. And I drew a very crude line uh, about where that construction has occurred. So you can see it kind of fragmented it into two sections. Um, and when this presentation occurred, um, there's two possibilities that can occur for box turtles that I want to observe. So if we think about box turtles home ranges, um, are they likely to cross over and mate? So let's pretend that these two circles act as the home ranges of uh, turtles. So let's say this is a female turtle and this is a male turtle. Uh, if there are fences separating these two individuals, they are less likely to mate. So you are decreasing the amount of mates in a population, which can decrease the population size over time. And um, there's also a possibility of them actually crossing over that area, which increases the potential of um, vehicular trauma or uh, another negative influence of humans. So if they cross over, um, I actually read an article that said, uh, uh, if a turtle crosses over a um, path that has vehicles like coming down it at like a more rapid speed, um, they are two out of three times, uh, two out of three times those turtles will um, have a collision with that car, which is kind of a terrifying thought because more likely than not these turtles can have the potential of undergoing some sort of trauma. Um, so you can tell these movements by these um, turtles by tracking. So that's what I'm gonna be doing. I'm gonna be tracking the movements of the turtles to be seen. Oh gosh, excuse me, I drink water. <laughs> So we'll be seeing um, whether or not these turtles will in fact move over those areas or if those two turtles will be interacting um, to see the actual influence of the habitat fragmentation on these turtle populations. So this actually leads me to turtle monitoring. And I included this graphic because I thought it was funny. So it's like rabbit saying, that's it likes me because I'm um, better um, master likes me better because I'm fluffier than the cat is like, no, master prefers me because I'm more uh, expressive. And then, ahem, guys, we know how this fight is gonna end. Let's not. I just thought it was funny. So, um, on to my observational research. Um, so before I actually am going to track the turtles, I, I want to observe them beforehand. So what I do is I will take the turtle weight. Uh, I do this by tearing a, um, a basket on a weight and then I'll place the turtle in. And then I'll determine the turtle length. So uh, we'll measure from the top of the carapace to the uh, bottom of the carapace uh, with a tape measure uh, to understand the curvature of the turtle shell. Uh, then I'll uh, determine the turtle age and turtle sex. So uh, after I finish all of those, I will label the turtle with a Sharpie. Um, and I do, uh, I label them by the order of sex I have found them and what sex it is. So this was the second female I caught, so it's labeled 2F. So how do I determine the uh, age of a box turtle? So I do this by counting something called the anoli. So these lines right here, these are called the anoli. Um, and Counting anoli can be difficult and it can be subjective because anoli, also called age rings, um, they can have true age rings and false age rings. Uh, false age rings are thinner and uh, less pronounced on the shell. And some people will count um, both true and false. Some will just count uh, one or the other. Some will make a mix of them because they're hard to differentiate. So in order to um, kind of eliminate that bias, I count the anoli on the shoot three times, and then I take that average, and then I average three shoots together to get me um, a 
the rough estimate of how many NOI are on that on a uh, shoot on the turtle. Um, and actually, NOI don't grow an annually. Uh, they grow with the growth of the turtle, which happens to be approximately once a year. So this just really gives you an estimate of the um, uh, box turtle age. No, how do I go back? No. Okay, wait. Here we go. Okay, sorry. Um, so next, I determine the um, box turtle sex. So how do I do this? I um, look at the eyes first and foremost. So females tend to have darker eyes that are usually brown. Uh, while males have more reddish oranges eyes. Uh, males also have a concave plasterone, thicker tails, and bigger hind legs. Um, so what a concave plasterone looks like is over here. It's a little indent for um, whenever a male will um, mount a female. Whenever they are in the process of procreating, they need that indent there to stay stable. Um, they also have these thicker tails that happen to be longer. You can see this here. Um, this is a male tail, um, and the cloaca is farther down than uh, would be on the female. So thus far, I have collected um, about seven turtle observations on site. Uh, four of them happen to be female, three of them are male. Um, and I found the date, the time, EP, sex, uh, the location I have written in um, observations I took of the turtle sitting, like how healthy it was, what it looked like, um, if it seemed stressed or not. Um, I also include the shell length, weight, tag number, and age. So now onto the adventure of turtle tracking. Uh, I also found this meme to be funny because um, it's very cute. <laughs> So I will be using um, transmitters and receivers to understand the movement of these turtles after I have observed um, the proper data beforehand. So what I will do is I will attach the transmitters to the turtles uh, and I will find them using a receiver. So I have the RI um, to the transmitters and the receiver I use is the TRX. 10S, which is actually looks a lot like this. So they basically um, will bounce radio waves off of each other to determine the distance they are apart. And uh, I will be getting help from this whole process uh, from a professor at SLU, um, whose name is Dr. Blake. He works with the Fox Turtle Connection, um, and he's been very helpful throughout this whole process. So how am I going to attach these trackers? Uh, I will actually just be using um, epoxy that you'll find at a Home Depot near you uh, to attach these trackers. Um, I will be attaching them on the lower coastal chute. Uh, I'm doing this because I don't want the trackers to be more pronounced uh, as to attract predators. Um, I will also put it on the lower coastal chute um, to avoid uh, damage to the tracker itself. It's most likely for the tracker to be damaged if it is on the lower post of shoot. And before I continue, I think it's important to note that there has been significant research on attaching uh, trackers to turtles. Uh, there are no significant hormonal uh, responses due to these trackers, um, and there are little to no physical effects, no negative effects have actually been observed thus far, and turtle tracking has been going on since, I believe, the 60s. Um, but just to make sure um, and taking take into account um, the turtle's health, I will be attaching the trackers in the field uh, as to not stress them more than they might already be stressed. Um, and I'll be trying to uh, write all my observations in the, in the into the field as well. So everything will probably happen in the field. Um, and the trackers I um, am using actually have a lifespan of about two years. So even though I'm a summer intern right now, uh, I will be collecting data for about a year. So I'm gonna continue to come back um, and try to find these turtles uh, 
every week or so to uh, get a proper data set. So on to the methodology. So currently um, in the whole process, I'm trying to obtain the proper permits. Uh, I do have a permit by uh, MDC. I am waiting on approval from a board saying it is okay for me to handle um, turtles in a healthy manner. Um, and after I get approval from that board at school, I can go and find the turtles and attach the trackers, as I mentioned before, how to do so. Um, and then after that, I will be taking weekly data of these uh, turtles to understand their movements throughout the years. And hopefully this will be continued um, after much after I'm gone. So you can see um, both evolve this construction and has uh, influenced the pathway. So while the while the fragmentation is occurred, has occurred, um, and afterwards. So after that area has been remediated, will the turtles uh, kind of change their behavior? So get a better understanding of how much impact that fragmentation had on those turtles. Um, so just observing those trends are important. So I think that is about it. Uh, that's about all I had. Uh, I did not have a fancy thank you slide, but I do want to say thank you to all of you guys who have helped me uh, because it is a long process that I definitely could not have done by myself. Good job, Hannah. Um, do we have any immediate questions? Let's see here, I got one that just came in. How long did it take you to find the turtles to study? So it took me, um, well, I mean, we were continuously looking for turtles. They are notoriously hard to find. They evolved very well to escape predation. Um, but so in about the 10 weeks I've been here, we've only found seven. So we haven't found uh, the turtle pile we'll be uh, attaching trackers to. I will be frolicking along the prairie to find these turtles. Um, so it's gonna still be a long process. You're getting some praise in the chat for uh, teaching our volunteers on new ways to identify turtles, especially with your word association with their, you know, their names and their, the way they look. Are you disappointed that soft shell turtles are not called the uh, water flapjacks? I love that so much. Is that, is that a nickname? I want that to be a nickname. <laughs> <laughs> it's just something I thought of while looking at them. <laughs> Uh, if we see a turtle while we are on the trails, should we let you know? Oh, of course. Um, and I forgot to mention this earlier. Um, it seems like whenever you are presenting, you forget uh, all the things that you had in mind to talk about. But so um, whenever you, I'm just going to note this, um, whenever you actually move a turtle from one spot to another, I think it's important that you keep them facing the direction they were tra uh, traveling because they get easily confused if you move them uh, around uh, outside of their home range. So just making sure that they um, have uh, the same direction in which they were traveling. So to avoid confusion for them. Yeah, what about on days? So like after you, so tomorrow's your last day of your internship, but since you will be coming back uh, on a weekly to biweekly basis to like kind of track turtles, uh, what should we do? Should we find a turtle and you are not here? Um, well, you can take that data for me if you would like. Um, so what would happen is you would take the turtle, you would weigh it, um, you would find its length. Uh, you would, um, uh, age it and sex it if you feel comfortable with doing so. Um, but if you don't feel comfortable doing so, you can send a picture to me. Uh, I would love to receive turtle pictures at random. It'd make me happy. Um, I mean, should I we uh, try way. and contact you to see if you're available for potentially coming in, uh, you know, once you've been given permission to actually put uh, the trackers on them, should we see if you're available to come, you know, attach one? 
Oh yeah. Okay. Um, just email me or text me, and I'll not run over. I will drive over um, <laughs> in a safe manner at a reasonable time. Very safe manner. <laughs> Uh, Susan asks, uh, will you be sharing your data with the folks who are tracking turtles in Forest Park and Tyson? Uh, yeah, because you, you didn't go, you didn't elaborate too much about your connections to the current ongoing projects. Yes, that is one of the other things I forgot to mention. Um, so I will be hopefully compiling my data with the um, turtle tracking project uh, run by um, Dr. Blake, uh, who's looking at turtles at uh, Tyson, uh, Ferguson School District, and uh, Forest Park. So I'll be adding my data to that collection to get a better understanding of turtle movement as a whole. All right. Um, from Mary, will there be any restoration of the MDC destruction? So MSD destruction of LREC before you finish your research? That would be hard to say. Uh, MSD's uh, ownership of that easement uh, lasts at least until uh, next October. So um, depending on the timing of Hannah's uh, beginning and ending of research, it would really depend on that. So she'll collect research that is prior to restoration? That's what Hannah's hope is, yeah, to try and get okay. data of how the turtles are interacting with the construction site existing. Okay. And then it would be really great if she came back and did some research after the restoration. I'm hoping to uh, pass it along to other, like hopefully uh, St. Louis University students who will be interested in coming on site and um, comparing that before and after. That's really what I'm interested in seeing. Um, great. You're not interested in getting your PhD in this? <laughs> um, <laughs> You know, as much as I would love to, I'll take a pass. <laughs> you got it. All right. From Adam, are there any native Missouri turtles trained in the ninja arts, uh, perhaps, <coughs> perhaps to avoid predation? The only turtles I have heard of only use sights. Um, they... <laughs> I, that is my only answer to that question. We can train them if need be. I yeah, hear they're very trainable. Yeah, I believe currently it's only the uh, New York turtles that are trained in the ninja arts. Um, for Mary, uh, maybe Hannah could help the turtles learn ninja arts. <laughs> I'm just saying, I am the master. Some loft, lofty goals from Hannah. All right, Hannah. <laughs> All right. Uh, do we have any further questions? Non Ninja Turtle questions? <laughs> All right. Um, Bailey, Hannah, fantastic job. Uh, you guys have been a pleasure to have here on staff over the summer. Um, thank you guys um, for going through all this and uh, taking the time to present to all the volunteers. Uh, any, if any, everybody wants to unmute if there's uh, any final words uh, want to be said here. Uh, if not, I will uh, stop the recording and let Susan take over for a little bit of uh, chat with the volunteers. Great job, kids. And goodbye and farewell and good luck. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat>